Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and medical director of the SIBO Doctor, an online education resource for practitioners. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. Medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to SIBO and associated conditions. Head over to thecebodoctor.com where you can learn everything about SIBO from the basics to advanced treatments. You can also join in the conversation on the SIBO Doctor Practitioner Forum Facebook group. If you're a patient, please note this information is not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. We welcome you to head over to the SIBO Lifestyle Facebook group, where we post frequent tips and videos to help you on the road to gut health recovery. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor podcast. Welcome, SIBO Doctor practitioners. I'm here with Dr. Sandeep Gupta, who is a mold specialist, and I'm really excited to have him here. Actually, in person, it's so rare for me to interview somebody in person and really sort of nutting out what mold toxicity is, what everybody's talking about. It falls in the category of um, contributing factors to the development of SIBO in terms of affecting motility, and I'm sure Dr. Gupta will enlighten us on other aspects of how it contributes to chronic illness. Dr. Gupta has been in practice for 20 years and with a specialty on chronic illness and mold for quite some time. And he also will talk about a mold course that he is offering to patients and give more information about how you can actually investigate this as a possibility for yourself. So welcome, Dr. Gupta. Thanks very much, Nirala. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me. And yeah, we've been talking about doing this podcast for quite some time. And um, I'm very glad that you've actually taken me hostage in person here so we (laughs) can actually get this done. Yes. And I really totally appreciate you coming down all the way from the Sunshine Coast to beautiful Byron Bay um, and um, doing this on a Sunday. That's how committed we are, people. So let's talk about what mold toxicity is. It's sort of like I know I've been aware of it for a number of years, and it's in that area of chronic um, illness, uh, you know, infections, all of these things that really affect our patients and the chronicity of their condition. But what do people really have to know and what, what do practitioners really have to know about mold illness? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the the first thing about it is there definitely does seem to be some people who are more susceptible to mold toxicity than others. And and that seems to be very clear. So for instance, if you have a a workplace which is quite water damaged or it's been flooded and is is high in in, in mold toxins, some people will tend to get um, really, really unwell and others may just have more mild symptoms. And those mild symptoms may just be things like a cough or congested sinuses, et cetera. Like I I think if if almost anyone's exposed to enough mold, they will develop those sorts of symptoms. Uh, And some will start to develop GI symptoms as well. That's probably the next thing. But some people get a whole body systemic inflammatory response syndrome, if you like, which which Dr. Shoemaker uh, referred to as chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And some people can become extremely debilitated by this illness and have symptoms that really uh, are part of almost every body system. And uh, until one can actually get them out of, of that exposure and, and really look at treating them for the, the mold toxins and so on they've been exposed to, it's, it's very, very hard to get them better. I think many practitioners will probably agree that sometimes when we treat SIBO, the SIBO part is not the hard part. It's about preventing relapse and it's about how do we actually uh, generally improve the health of our patients. And some people that are really ill and defy a really obvious diagnosis, this is one of the, you know, I, I always think of, I ask about things like root canal. I ask about things like, do you live in a in a moldy or in a water damaged building? You know, do you have these symptoms that are associated with mold toxicity? So we start to kind of cast our net wider. 
in terms of what is the the chronic um, insult to that patient that's contributing to why they're not overcoming SIBO. So what about mold toxicity? What is it about it that really predisposes people to SIBO? Yeah, I I think that's a great question. And and really, I guess the original research group in which Richie Shoemaker was the uh, head researcher didn't specifically look at SIBO. They really just looked at it as being a a, um, systemic kind of condition. And they looked at all the different body systems. And, and of course, one of them was the gastrointestinal system. And in order to really qualify to uh, be considered to be a patient who has SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, you needed to have a certain number of, of, of systems involved. And so often, often people, you know, that would include a gastrointestinal component. And really when we started looking at this condition more carefully and particularly at the gastrointestinal part of it, uh, we often did find that that's, these patients would test positive for SIBO and, and their symptoms in the gastrointestinal domain really fit that profile. And so really that started us on a little bit of a journey on, uh, on, on looking at what is it about mold toxicity that may predispose people to not only getting SIBO but not being able to recover from it. And, and it seems to me that there's, there's a number of different factors. Um, of course, one of the big ones is it's just, you know, people who, who get severe problems from mold toxicity really have a, a major degree of immune dysfunction going on. And I, I pre- presume that part of recovering from SIBO is being able to have a functional immune system, which is able to protect from excess bacteria in the gut. And the other part, which I've heard you talk about a lot, is the motility side of things. And um, what we know is that some of the, the peptide hormones which become low in, um, in chronic inflammatory response syndrome include um, VIP, or vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. And, and this is really interesting because when I researched this a bit more, I found out that, well, VIP actually works on the serotonergic neurons in the small intestine. And what's responsible for motility? Often it's you know the serotonergic neurons, and we uh, we all know that most of the serotonin in the body is actually in the gut, not in the brain. And so having low VIP does seem to predispose patients to low motility, and therefore uh, and therefore SIBO. And when you add the immune dysfunction into it, and there's also possibly a bile component to it that the, the bile is possibly affected, the quality of the bile, due to the fact that the body is, you know, using the bile to actually conjugate mycotoxins and so on. So I believe there's, there's quite possibly three components to it, but there's the motility component, there's the immune component, and then there's the bile component. And the three of those uh, combined really add up to a situation where it, it does uh, seem that people have a lot of difficulty recovering from SIBO when they're in the midst of mold toxicity. So let's imagine that we are, um, or, or practitioners are sitting in their in their office or in their clinic and they're listening to this. And what would be the indicators that you look for that really are the red flags that a patient might have mold toxicity or SIRS? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And and of course, the first and most important thing is the history taking. And I, I think one of the key things is, is there's at least to be a little bit of sophistication in the questions. And when I started off, I used to ask patients, do you live in a mouldy building? And of course, <laughs> uniformly, the answer is no, of course I don't. You think I'm a horrible person or something. So there's almost like there's a little bit of a cultural um, block to that question being answered. People just think that you're asking them if they still live in their parents' basement yeah, or that's something. A, yeah, that's right. So so there needs to be a little bit more sophistication and often just, you know, getting into some more specific questions and asking them, do you notice musty odours in any area of the house? Has there been a, a, a leak of any of your white goods or the pipes or anything in the home? Are there any rooms in the house that you go into that you don't feel the best? If you ever noticed any visible mold? There's a whole there's a whole range of questions, and the more you study this area, the more you're able to to get skilled at asking these questions. And um, of course, some sometimes the problem is is that patients may not have any awareness themselves. 
and that then that's a little bit more more tricky. But if they have some awareness around the fact that there's some musty smells at home, maybe they know they've noticed that they feel better when they they leave the home for for several days or a week. Those things are all very very strong pointers. Um, there are some little features on examination, but they're pretty subtle. Like you know, for instance, people may patients may have a fine tremor. That's that's a, a, a sign of mold toxicity. Um, there's very various, various other subtle things that you can look at, but often examination's not particularly helpful. Obviously, if they do have SIBO as a complication um, or other or other gastrointestinal infections, you'll you'll notice they've got abdominal tenderness, mm-hmm. and uh, and and you know sometimes they can have a really really very tender abdomen. And then and then the bedside test that we often use in in practice is, is the visual contrast sensitivity test. And um, and that's a really interesting test, which really uh, looks at the patient's ability to discern fine shades of grey. And it comes from the finding that when patients have a lot of inflammation, that affects the optic nerve and that that's, um, manifests as the inability to detect subtle differences in shades of grey. So as a practitioner, you can actually purchase that from survivingmold.com, which is spelled the American way, M-O-L-D which is uh, Dr. Richie Shoemaker's website. And, uh, and, and then one other tool we often use is called the cluster analysis of symptoms. And um, just to explain that one quickly, really it goes into the idea that CIRS or SIRS is, is a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. So whether or not you use the, the cluster questionnaire, the key is to try and discern from the history is the person suffering from more of a single system or, or dual system illness, or is it truly multi system? And so, if they say, oh, "I've got some, you know, I've got some bloating and diarrhea and abdominal pain, uh, and that's it," well, no, no, that's not SIRS. That's that's a predominantly gastrointestinal illness. Uh, if they say, "I've got some abdominal pain and diarrhea, but also some confusion and difficulty sleeping," but that's pretty much it then you're still dealing with something that's predominantly two, you know, one or two body systems. But if they say, yes, I've got, you know, I've got the abdominal symptoms and I've got the, some brain symptoms, but I've also got muscle pains. I've also got joint pains. I've also got, um, you know, palpitations. Um, I've got, you know, I get chest pains. I get fevers. Then you're starting to see that, you know, this is really, this is really a, a whole body problem. And, and that was considered to be one of the most important definitions or one of the most important criteria rather for for a patient having um, CIRS is that the, it, it needs to be multi-system and then you know so if, if those sort of things like the history taking and maybe some basic examination findings and the visual contrast test and the cluster analysis um, if they're all lining up it's actually just those alone is actually pretty accurate it's you know one study suggested it's it's more than 95 percent likely that they do have CIRS, but then there are some some more um, fancy tests you can do, including um, the Quest blood testing, uh, which we're, we, at the moment is actually only available on the Sunshine Coast in Australia, but we're trying to get it uh, available throughout the different capital cities in Australia. And you can go, you know, looking at at, at tests like TGF beta one and C four A and MSH, um, and and that can be really helpful. So these are just specific mold like, or response indicators or markers that you're testing how your body is responding to particular molds rather than looking for mold toxins themselves yeah right? it's more yeah it, it's mm. more it's more looking at the the body's response and and you could say they're not specific markers they're, mm. they're general markers and then they don't actually 100 percent tell you that mold is the problem but they tell show you that there is a typical inflammatory response which is is typical of SIRS. The other thing is you, there are some blood tests you can do if, if, if there's doctors listening. Um, you know, you can order things like, you know, VIP or vasoactive intestinal polypeptide and leptin and cortisol and uh, osmolality. Those are things that you can order locally uh, through the, the labs, um, you know, and, and some of those are available under Medicare. But, yeah, as, as Narala said, they're, they're these all of these are... Um, markers of inflammation, but I, I guess that the key thing is if you've got that and that's linked with a history of mold exposure, yeah. that's where it starts to, to create a picture. Yeah, and you know, you and I had this conversation before we actually started the podcast in terms of 
you know, for example, mast cell activation syndrome, that diagnosis really has only been around, I think, something like 10, 15 years, and it's now gaining much more attention. Um, same with mold toxicity, that's really been shoved into the limelight by Dr. Shoemaker. And we could add stealth infections and really these these syndromes and, and conditions that we haven't really had enough time to completely research because... I think as, as practitioners, this is one of the frustrating uh, encounters is when we have a patient that's obviously sick, demonstrating symptoms in many different uh, systems. It's always about what do you do first and how do you go about understanding what their primary issue is? Because I, you know, now um, that many years later, I see people that are really, really ill. They they come to me, I guess they've been referred for SIBO, but it's actually, the SIBO is not a problem. It's these other issues that we try to really get in touch with and figure out if um, if that person has stealth infections and so forth. So I'm just sort of uh, wanting to emphasize sometimes the degree of difficulty it, the practitioner has if uh, patients are listening. It's not an easy thing to wade through this sort of wilderness of different conditions. So... Um, but let's go back to the visual test. So people can actually just do this simply on Dr. Shoemaker's website for like $15 or something, right? Yeah. And that website, again, is survivingmold.com. Yeah, and Dr. Great. Shoemaker was the sort of like really brought that, just like Dr. Pimentel brought SIBO into our vocabulary. Dr. Shoemaker really um, can be credited for drawing attention to this really important issue. Now, what about somebody says, okay, wow, that fits my my conditions. I get really sick when I'm in a moldy place or a musty environment. And certainly here in the Northern Rivers area, we have a lot of musty and moldy homes. Um, what's the first, uh, you know, I, I sometimes think about the ermy plates. Mm -hmm. um, do you find those really helpful? Those are plate, like little Petri dishes that the patient can order and just put them in different areas of their house and collect mold spores and send them in. Are, are there a good place to start? Yeah. Um, yeah. So just, just to clarify that, there's two separate things. So Petri dishes are one, and they can be quite useful um, where you, you know, yeah, you're using Petri dishes and sending them off and and, and, and the, the, a lab can do a, a basic culture on them. There's also air samples uh, looking for, for mold and bacteria and so on. And then there's ERMI. ERMI is actually a dust uh, a dust sample, which is tested for PCR um, or polymerase chain reaction of DNA fragments for uh, various mold species. And that's either collected through a Swiffer cloth or a vacuum cleaner um, attachment. And so there's no perfect test, I guess, is the one important um, concept. There's no perfect test with regard to testing a indoor environment for mold toxicity and um, each have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the industry standard up till now has actually been the air testing, but the problem with the air testing is, is the majority of mold is actually not in the air. It's actually settled in surfaces. And there's a number of species that will never really be able to be cultured through um, air samples. And, um, and therefore, although you can get a general idea, sometimes it will tend to miss um, miss the, the sort of dwellings in which people are who are particularly sensitive um, are having problems. So there is some limitations to air testing. Um, Petri dishes are a good simple way. Actually, they're not one that I've used myself, but Neil Nathan, uh, who's a physician in, in California, r recommends them as a basic screening tool. And I guess one thing that he finds useful about them is if people see mold growing on them, that's actually a very powerful visual motivator that they actually see the, the mold themselves. So that, that could be one. And one, what's that called again? The, the, I think they're just called the, the Petri dish, um, Petri dish mold tests. I actually not sure whether in Australia, which is the best supplier at this point, but that's something I I've been meaning to explore. I haven't actually utilized at this point, but I know Neil Nathan, um, who's considered one of the top docs in this field is, is, um, saying can be a useful tool. But uh, jumping onto Ermi, Ermi, I guess one disadvantage is a little is it is a little bit more expensive. It runs around about three hundred and fifty dollars, and that's just for one sample. So generally speaking, 
people would tend to just do one sample for the entire home. And so one disadvantage is you don't get an idea of which rooms mm. are more of a problem. It's just a general mm. a general sample. But it is very sensitive, so that means that it, you know, it won't tend to miss a lot of buildings that have some degree of problem. Um, the downside of that is is it may lack specificity. So in other words, some people may have a slightly higher score and really there isn't that much of a problem. So it's really just a starting point and I really also recommend counselling patients not to panic when they get the result of that mm. because, you know, it, it's it's not common for people to get a very, very low score and, and often there's going to be some, you know, there's some mould species error and, I guess the question then is still after you've done some form of testing for the patient, um, whether there's still a causal relationship between their their home or their workplace and the, their symptoms. And one of the things, and this wasn't actually something that Dr. Shoemaker recommended so much, but I found in an Australian context it, it's very, very helpful, is just doing what we call a, a mould sabbatical. And it costs nothing really other than the cost of camping. <laughs> but you get the patient to go camping for a around a week or so. Mm. Yeah, and um, the tent needs to be non-water damaged and need to not take too many possessions, mainly just uh, freshly washed clothes and um, uh, really not, a, not too many other things, you know. And often it's quite actually quite a powerful time for people. People sometimes can do a digital detox at the same time and uh, and really just tune in and and the idea is that you know just being de, de exposed from their home or workplace um, should have a significant lowering of the inflammatory cascade and then when they re expose themselves uh, to you know and usually it's the home we're talking about but yeah if we if they re expose themselves to the home they should notice a significant difference in symptoms on the re exposure it's kind of like you know what we used to learn in in in, um, in uh, at ACNEM and so on, which is the College of, of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, when, um, you know, trying to work out if someone has a gluten or casein problem, you know, one of the most accurate things is just eliminate and re-challenge. And, and so it's, it, it is quite similar. And I found that, that the, the reason I think that's very important is, firstly, you also you want it to be the patient's own experience rather than you just telling them because also it's, it's not a cheap process. No, it isn't. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. But, you know, one one thing I just wanted to clarify because, <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the understanding that when somebody's actually been diagnosed with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, they actually have the genetic predisposition to not switch off their innate immune system. And so when they actually go on this mold sabbatical, mm -hmm. um, they they may not feel different. Is that is that not mm -hmm. correct? Because the... the, the the issue is that the in, innate immune system just cannot switch itself off. Right. Yeah, I, I think I think that is true to a certain degree. And, and I guess what I'm not saying is that just getting away from the home is going to give complete recovery. Mm. But usually we do find this, there is at least partial improvement. And so to some degree it does depend on the patient's ability to be able to tune into subtle symptoms. Mm. But generally I believe there will be some subtle that's There'll what you see. That's really good to know because it's it's so sometimes confusing and hopeless for people when they're just well, like, well, it's activated. Where do I go now? You know. So that's really good news is that if you do remove yourself from from potential exposures, that there is a degree of improvement and sometimes dramatic, as yeah, you say. That's right. Now let's kind of go back for a second because people listening, they probably still in their mind, well, that doesn't address, that doesn't, maybe they've already turned off this podcast <laughs> if they think that doesn't have apply to them. But tell us how even simple water damage can have an impact, like um, from the from the air conditioner, for example, or a, a tiny leak that you didn't know existed. Can you give mm -hmm. us more examples of mm -hmm. how the da how houses can be damaged or offices? Okay. Um, so do you mean talking about the difference between subtle water damage and more extensive, or you mean just talking about more the causes of what, what can damage a building? Yeah. Like what can actually damage a okay. building that yeah. people aren't, maybe it's not visible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see the point now. Yeah. So, so that is a really important point. And, and often when people think about a water damage building, they think about like, you know, the movie Fight Club where there's, um, there's water dripping um, from the walls <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, you know, there's black mold visible on, 
um, on the walls. I have I have one of those pictures in my mold course, and um, we like to joke about that. But often, often mold toxicity in homes is actually very subtle, and in the majority of cases, it's not visible. And the thing about it is, is it's actually the it's inside the walls. The problem is 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 interior, and therefore you you're not actually going to see the mold but it's actually aerosolizing into the air and so some of the causes would be like a roof that's leaking you know whether that be to you know due to to broken roofing materials or sometimes it can just be as simple things just like you know the actual gutters of a of a uh, a roof being totally clogged up and the water not being able to uh to drain and essentially, just you know, starting to to run into the into the walls. There's very simple, you know, building problems like that. Another really simple one is just that the the walls where they've been joined in a home are not properly sealed, and and you know, often homes in Australia, you know, are built in a major rush, and the building codes do not in any way um, protect. Um, you know, protect uh, people who are are having the, a house built from having their building that's susceptible to water damage. So you can imagine if you've got you know walls that are not properly sealed and you've got a major rainstorm or something like that, you know, that there's just a high chance that you're going to get water from the roof starting to to mm. come in and seep in some way. So so building defects are a big one, and it's hard to get away from that. But then there's, yeah, there is more things like um, pipe leaks. So, um, you know, they can just be normal water pipes that are in the in the walls or they can be really small pipings. And then one that we've seen quite often actually is when people have, um, have ice makers in their refrigerator in the modern fridges. Often they have very small tubing for, you know, into the ice makers and, and often um, mice or rats go and chew on them. And therefore, you you just have a little hole in the um in these small pipes, and that's just always leaking, and you may not know about it for mm. years. Mm. And there's just water, little bits of water, um, slowly dripping into the substance of the building. And you know, so what happens is if a building is exposed to water, um, for forty eight hours or greater, then that is defined as a water damage building and that that building becomes susceptible to microbial growth and and that's not just mold it's mold it's bacteria it's parasites as well it's uh, things like mycoplasma and chlamydia it's quite amazing the different microbes that grow in a water damage building legionella is something we've certainly heard of mm-hmm. and then there's you know there's also other chemicals like volatile organic compounds and so on so so when a, the substance of a building becomes exposed to water for 48 hours or longer it then becomes a uh, it's like a petri dish in itself then for for all of these different microbes and chemicals and so on to start growing and we may be totally oblivious thank you for listening to the SIBO doctor podcast we hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOTest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering, and Quintron, maker of outstanding breath testing equipment. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. Thanks again for listening.